This is Point of Inquiry for Friday, July 6, 2007. Welcome to Point of Inquiry. I'm DJ Grothy. Point of Inquiry is the radio show and podcast of the Center for Inquiry, a think tank advancing science and reason and secular values in public affairs. Before we get to this week's guest, Christopher Hitchens, to talk about his new book, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything, here's a word from this week's sponsor. The world is under assault today by religious extremists who invoke their particular notion of God to try and control what others think and do. One magazine is dedicated to keeping you up to date with analysis that cuts through the noise and the surprising courage to appear politically incorrect. That magazine is Free Inquiry, the world's leading journal of secular humanist opinion and commentary. Regular contributors include Richard Dawkins, Wendy Kaminer, Christopher Hitchens, Peter Singer, and Sam Harris. Their views are reasoned, thought-provoking, and to some, unpardonably infuriating. Subscribe to Free Inquiry today. One year, six controversial issues for 1995. Call 1-800-458-1366 or visit us on the web at secularhumanism.org. I'm really happy to be joined today on Point of Inquiry by Christopher Hitchens, one of the world's leading public intellectuals and social commentators. Christopher Hitchens is an Anglo-American writer, a journalist, he's a literary critic, he's currently living in Washington, D.C., and he's been a columnist at Vanity Fair, The Atlantic, The Nation, Slate, and our magazine, Free Inquiry. He's especially well-known for uh, going after controversial subjects like Henry Kissinger and Mother Teresa, and his new book, God is Not Great, well, he goes after the biggest subject of them all, God. Christopher Hitchens, welcome to Point of Inquiry. Very nice of you to have me. You're neither a theologian nor a scientist. The first time I ever got acquainted with you was in the 1990s when I saw you on C-SPAN. You were lecturing on Homer, and now you're writing a book against God. So the question is that we'll, we'll start off with, where do you get off taking on the most important and valuable concept that most people have? Yes, you've taken a lot of other sacred cows on, Mother Teresa, but shouldn't someone's religious beliefs in America be their private business? I mean, isn't it supposed to be out of the bounds in America to go after someone's views about the Almighty God? Well, if they would keep their views to themselves, so to speak, and just meet and talk about virgin births and resurrections and jihads, and uh, if they're Jewish, pray every morning, as the Orthodox do, that they're very glad God didn't make them a woman or a Gentile. As long as I don't have to hear this stuff, I don't mind at all. Um, If I meet someone who has these opinions, I would, of course, disagree with them. And I won't think that they have the right to demand respect for their opinions a priori. They, They have no more right to respect for their opinions than anyone else does. But the thing is, isn't it, that they won't leave me out of it. I mean, whether it's um, trying to have stultifying nonsense taught in the schools under the bogus name of intelligent design, the latest guise for creationism, or stopping stem cell research in the name of God, or saying that AIDS may be bad, as the Catholics will sometimes concede, but that contraceptives would be much worse. Uh, The thing keeps on bursting its bounds, and ceasing to be a private belief or a matter of conscience or faith becomes what we call religion. That's to say, people who think that God is telling them what to do and telling them how to tell others how to behave. So I argue in my, in my book that if it could be kept private, then I'd be perfectly happy with it. But as soon as that line is crossed, it ceases to be a difference of opinion and becomes more than an argument, becomes a fight. Right. You're writing this to engage in that fight. You want to diminish the role of religion in the public square. You're fine if they keep it private, but the fact that they're not is what gets your hackles up. Do you really think that Christians and Muslims and Jews and other faith heads, to use Dawkins' term, are they going to pick up your book and have their irrational religiosity jostled from them? Or are you just writing this for atheists, uh, people who are going to laugh and enjoy your great writing, and then just put the book on their shelf and feel superior to their religious neighbor? Well, I had two motives in writing the book, two hopes, in fact. One was, as you say, to put some heart into what is emerging as a very fast-growing 
the movement in the United States, that's to say of people not necessarily atheist, but skeptical. Um, point of inquiry and the success of your show, for example, is one of the indices of this. It's less and less a private, shamed, unpopular belief and more and more a, a, a well-affirmed one. And I wanted to help this process along in the footsteps of my titanic uh, predecessors, uh, Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett and Sam Harris, and actually to write a book that wasn't just for specialists. Um, you don't have to be a scientist to read my book. That's the first thing. The second was I hope to take the war to the enemy. And I arranged my book tour so that it took me through the South, largely, and that I had a debate with a believer or a representative of belief at every stop, which I was able to do. And I was extremely pleased to read in the Wall Street Journal recently, who were kind enough to run a, an article about the success of the book, that in, the, in Bible Belt bookstores, the uh, bookstore proprietors report that the book is flying off the shelves on what they call a know-your-enemy basis. In other words, the faithful are, I think, at a point now in America where they realize they can't have it all their own way anymore. They better engage because um, there's a change in the zeitgeist, and there are people who've had enough of being coerced and lectured by them. You just mentioned the Wall Street Journal article. It's reported in a couple places in the media that your publisher thought your book was originally just going to be moderately successful. Its first printing was only something like 30,000 copies. But now it's sold much more than that. It's made its way onto the number one spot in the New York Times bestsellers list. One, did that surprise you? And two, does this massive success of the book tell you that everyone's really engaged in this fight, this science versus religion fight, as Dawkins and Harris and you and Dennett have framed it? Well, not to be immodest, but yes, it did briefly hit number one on the Times bestseller list. And it's been fairly high on that list for some time. It's been number one in Canada and quite close to number one in, in England and Ireland and Australia and New Zealand as well, I understand. But... but um, now I'm covering myself with uh, blushes because this is not, I think, just because of my blue eyes. <laughs> it is because of a willingness among non-believers to show support in that way for authors who speak for them. And I think also an awareness among believers that they are involved in an argument. I mean, the thing that's gratified me the most has been the reception in the religious press I was invited on the Christianity Today website, for example, for an exchange that went on for six weeks with one of their champions, Dr. Douglas Wilson. I was reviewed by Michael Novak, who you'll probably know as a very serious conservative Catholic in the National Review, and he said, look, um, these points that Hitchens made can't just be laughed off. These are criticisms we have to learn to take seriously, and that's music to my ears, really, because it means battle has been joined, and that the complacency of those who think that everyone in America is an uncritical, um, faith-based type can be shown to be false. So you don't think all religious people are non-thinking believers in nonsense? You might think it's nonsense, but people have reasons for their belief, and that's what you're engaging with. Well, I don't know if I'd go as far as to say they do have reasons for their belief, because I, I'd, I'd have to say in this whole uh, tour, with a debate with some kind of uh, believer or of a Baptist preacher or a rabbi or a Catholic minister at almost every stop. I haven't yet heard a single new argument. Uh, the same old stale stuff keeps on coming up. Most notably, where would we get our morals from if it wasn't for the fear of a heavenly dictatorship? I mean, the stupidest old arguments trotted out as if they were new. But the fact that people are willing to debate and to do this in front of large and skeptical and humorous audiences is, I think, a good sign. And I I will say that I haven't had any real rudeness or abuse, not that I would care, or, or any attempts to shut me down except an attempt to ban the book in Malaysia and I suppose <laughs> one, one radio station in North Carolina that having broadcast everything I'd had to say did say that I was going to hell, but I, I could care less about that. Mm. I want to uh, talk to you about actually what you say in the book, but just one more question about the God is not great phenomena. 